Late last year, a woman arrived at an airport dragging two large bags weighing nearly 50 kilograms each. She attempted to walk through the nothing to declare lane, but seeing such large bags, customs officers stopped her, making the decision to x-ray the luggage. The image that came back looked like a bag full of books, and as you can imagine, this is somewhat suspect, and so the bags were opened. And as you can probably guess, what they found wasn't books, but nearly 100 kilograms of cocaine, neatly cut into blocks and wrapped in foil to avoid x-ray detection. Officials said that the cocaine seizure was worth about 14.6 million US dollars. A month later, another passenger flying from the same airport as the woman arrived at his destination. Again, custom officers suspected something was off and requested to search his bags. In one bag, they found soap, 76 bars of bright, almost fluorescent yellow or white soap. Certainly an unusual amount for a person to be carrying, for sure. So what about the other bag? Well, that had two plastic bottles containing a cream-like liquid. After further testing, you can probably guess what this was. Yeah, cocaine. The bars of soap were also made of cocaine, and the cream, that was liquid cocaine. Overall, the total weight was over 13 kilograms, thought to be worth over half a million dollars. The woman was detained in Ethiopia, the man in Nigeria, but both these passengers had flown from Jomo Kenyatta International Airport, Nairobi, Kenya. In 2019, a powerful drug kingpin who went by the name of Shkuba stood in front of a federal courtroom in the United States. He'd once been at the head of a large and sprawling transnational criminal network that distributed heroin around the world. But he'd been extradited to face charges alongside 10 others, and they'd pled guilty to trafficking over 1,600 kilograms of heroin, and Shkuba was sentenced to over eight years in prison. His real name was Ali Khatib Haji Hassan, and he was a Tanzanian, and his criminal empire sourced heroin from Pakistan and Iran, as well as tons of cocaine from South America, and for around a decade distributed it across the world to China, the United States, and Europe. And he was captured in his native Tanzania after a two-year manhunt. In August of last year, a consignment that was declared as multi-purpose anti-slip mats destined for Australia was stopped at OR Tambo International Airport in Johannesburg, South Africa. This seemingly rather dull consignment was concealing a secret, a very, very large secret. And after the South African Revenue Service customs officials looked closer, it was revealed. 785 kilograms of crystal meth also known as Tick, estimated to be worth around 13 million US dollars. In October of last year, India made one of their biggest drug busts in its history when hidden in a consignment of pears, apples and oranges was 158 kilograms of high purity crystal meth and nine kilograms of cocaine. This shipment of fruit had come from South Africa. Africa is often the forgotten continent for things like drug trafficking. But as these stories show, beyond no illusions, the African continent plays a critical role in the global illicit drug market. And it's growing. And no more so than in East and Southern Africa. Welcome to Deep Dive from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organised Crime. I'm Jack Megan Vickers. And this is the drug markets of East and Southern Africa. All right. So, so what were you saying? This is Jason Eli, a senior fellow at the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. Now, over the past few years, Jason has produced three incredibly detailed reports looking at illicit drug markets across East and Southern Africa. The perspectives, plural, that we're getting on what is occurring in these places at a particular point in time is really rich and I think is a testament to the general weakness of the overall view of what we think we know is occurring in these places because we really don't. 
and we'll be looking at what made these investigations different from previous ones in more detail. But first, Africa is often thought of as just that, a single entity. But Africa is a continent, comprising of well over a billion people with thousands of languages and dialects spoken by a huge, diverse range of individuals. And that diversity is hardly surprising given that there are 54 recognised countries on the continent, and these are spread across deserts, rainforests, savannah, grasslands, mountains and coastlines. Jason's research focused specifically on East and Southern Africa, which in this context stretches from Kenya to South Africa. But of course, we can't talk about each country individually. So in this podcast, we'll talk regionally, but also focus on three of them, Kenya, Tanzania and South Africa. And so, as Jason said, we think we know more than we actually do. And that is why this research is so important, because it fills gaps and updates our perceptions. Through the course of this research, we've really gained a new perspective on not only the degree to which drugs are being consumed in these countries, but also the breadth and diversity of the drug markets that are involved. Often people will look at statistics such as seizure statistics or arrests, and it's through those numbers that they will then deduce what is occurring and also what is not occurring in a particular area. But it's important to note that seizures are just glimpses in time. They are not in and of themselves a really strong data point through which characteristics of a particular national domestic drug market can be drawn. So a seizure indicates that a particular substance was at a particular place at a particular point in time, and perhaps we can draw some network connections through that. But it's extremely difficult and, and dangerous in some cases to draw any further definitive conclusions from seizures than that. And certainly the absence of a seizure is, is not to be equated with the absence of a drug being consumed in a particular place or being moved across a particular place. And this has become quite evident in the work that we've been doing in these countries and in no small part down to the thousands of people who use drugs who've been involved in the research and uh, also, I think, importantly, down to the uh, around 500 local drug distributors who were interviewed in the research. And we also interviewed nearly 100 high-level drug importers, in addition to law enforcement and security professionals. So at the start of this episode, I told you two stories about cocaine. The guy who was caught in Nigeria and the woman in Ethiopia both carrying a large amount of cocaine, and both had travelled from Jomo Kenyatta International Airport, Nairobi, Kenya. So why has Kenya become such an important node for cocaine? And who are the criminal networks involved in the trafficking? And what about domestic cocaine markets in the country? From the research carried out by Jason and his team, cocaine use in Kenya comes in two forms, powder and crack cocaine. Generally, across the countries, the most common form is crack cocaine. Certainly it's cheaper, it's sold by the stone, and the community of people who use it tend to be at the lower end of the economic spectrum. Those who use powder cocaine, powder cocaine has a bit of cachet as it does in, in most countries. Uh, being a stimulant, of course, it's uh, popular in clubs, uh, but also it tends to be the substance that people with a bit of money would, uh, would gravitate towards. There is a bit of classism in terms of drugs and who uses what uh, to some degree. And I think cocaine represents that quite well in many places across the continent. So cocaine basically follows class lines. Of course, there is overlap, but nonetheless, it does tend to skew that way. According to Jason's research, there are around 10,000 people who use cocaine in Kenya, which is a relatively small amount in comparison with, for example, South Africa, who have approximately 350,000 users. The estimated annual consumption is just 0.34 metric tons. Again, in comparison to South Africa, whose considerably higher number of users also consume 18.8 metric tons of cocaine. And so, of those 10,000 users, who are they? Cocaine is popular with rich people because it's expensive. You will not find it in the streets. Uh, the common man cannot afford because it's very expensive. This is a researcher who worked on the project with Jason. So it's popular with rich people, it's popular with businessmen. 
And with this comes a lot of security around it. Uh, even the people who sell it, they know the dangers that come with it. So it's not easy to get the information. And when they give you the information, they must be sure that you are, you are not going to give out their names. Again, cocaine is also popular with university students who come from rich families. And it's common in rich neighborhoods and, of course, foreigners, foreigners in, in the hotel industry. A specific story that we'd share was about one sex worker uh, that we found in a, a ta- one of the towns in Kenya where the harm reduction services are not yet being offered. So the day that we went and we had a meeting with the research assistants and everybody who was in the room, Nobody acknowledged that there were drug users in the town. But as we continue to give the information afterwards, all the sex workers came forward and say, well, drug use is part of the sex work. So they went ahead, collected the data. And, and as time went by and they got more and more information from us about harm reduction and drug use, they started to open up. One of them actually had a fatal overdose and uh, there was no way she could be helped. Uh, the services are 90 kilometers away. The family was not aware that she was using drugs. And when she was referred to the clinic, um, the body was already cold. It's a stark reality of the world these exploited young women are a part of. But for this research, sex workers were vital in getting an understanding of how the drug operation works on the ground. First of all, sex workers play a big role in the drug sale because they're used as conduits. A lot of their clients are, are the drug lords and they know where they stay, they know their lifestyle and they are trusted. So sex workers sell, uh, sex workers transport drugs and they have a lot of information. And uh, they also gave us a lot of information on methamphetamine and the cocaine because these are drugs that we could not find in the streets. The use of drugs in tourism hotspots like Kalifi County or Kwale on the border of Tanzania is high in comparison to other parts of the country. But this is a trend that's not unique to Kenya. Drug use and tourism hotspots walk hand in hand, as does increases in sex work. It happens all over the world. What I'd really like to understand is the drug distribution networks on the ground and how they are structured, is Jason. I think just to maybe generalize a little bit if I can, Certainly you have individuals who are responsible for the importation and the, these are individuals across society and in, in many cases can include senior government officials or family members of senior government officials. These are people with the cash to bankroll the purchase and the importation of these substances. You have then a, a level of individuals who are responsible for accepting and distributing these substances, whether it's to repackage them for onward transit or to distribute them for sale to, to local wholesalers. You have a further level down of individuals who will cut some substances. What I mean here is adulterate them in some way to reduce their purity and, and increase their volume. They'll then be repackaged and distributed to street dealers who will then sell them to users. Also, within these networks, you'll have individuals who are responsible for moving the money, for taking care of the cash flow. And often these are also individuals who are parts of the formal, quote unquote, licit economy, whether they be in banking or or some other aspect. These are individuals who are facilitating the trade in the cash that's related to the drugs. And they are an extremely important element of the structure of supply and distribution. And so, as with any illicit market, corruption is the grease that keeps the parts running smoothly. And as our researcher said to me when talking about high-end distributors, she said, we know they are guarded by the police, but we don't know who. Corruption plays a big role uh, because one, these drugs get into the country through our borders. Sometimes the officers are aware that it's coming through and uh, the big men are given protection. The sellers are given protection. Some of them have politi- senior political posts. Um, the trade goes on. The policemen are aware. The, the sellers actually told us that they pay policemen um, up to 200000 that is 2000 US dollars a month to protect them so that they are not arrested. Uh, All this is corruption. And when the exhibit is taken to court, somebody else takes it and sells it. That's also an element of corruption. 
so uh, corruption m- makes sure that officers look the other way when the drugs come in and they are being sold. So that, that is how corruption has aided the drug trade in Kenya. Uh, and then again, this money, it's getting, it gets into the economy. It's, it gets into circulation. It's used in the, in the real estate. It's used in, uh, in the hotel industry. Collaboration between criminal markets and state-embedded actors is widespread in the cocaine trade in Kenya. In the report, A Powder Storm, the Cocaine Markets of East and Southern Africa, Jason writes that politics and crime are so interlinked, they can appear to be inseparable. So who are the international syndicates involved in the cocaine trade? According to Jason's research, there are criminal groups from Italy, and for regular listeners of Deep Dive, no prizes to guess who that might be. Also, you have smugglers from places like Pakistan, India and Iran, as well as those from Nigeria, Guinea and the neighbouring countries of Tanzania and Somalia. But the overwhelming majority of those involved in this illicit trade in Kenya are Kenyans themselves. While there, there is some degree of international syndicate involvement in what is occurring there, a large part of what is occurring is, is occurring because of the complicity of state institutions and some members of those institutions, government bodies, members of the business community, and others who are acting as brokers, who are acting as agents facilitating the flow of these goods. But the people who are allowing these substances into the country who are facilitating their trade, their storage, their distribution, are nationals of the country involved. And I think we need to really consider the role that corruption and complicity is playing in the facilitation and enablement of these illicit trades in the region. And of course, again, this doesn't hold true as a unique factor just to this region. This is something that occurs around the world. But in particular to the region of which we're discussing, the elements are, are really quite pronounced. There is a significant involvement of some law enforcement assets in the facilitation of, of the illicit trades that are occurring. And if the body that is responsible for disrupting and interdicting the trade is the body that is also enabling the trade, then we have a very challenging situation on our hands. Despite cocaine use being at a fairly low level domestically in Kenya, the position the country finds itself in as a transit country cannot be ignored. And one of the reasons for this is the biggest port in the region, at Kenya's second city of Mombasa, which is a popular node in the transportation of cocaine from South America, primarily Brazil. Well, Mombasa is certainly an important port in the region. And it's had a long history with respect to illicit markets, not not just drugs, wildlife products, environmental products, a variety of other elements moving through the port. So the fact that uh, there's some volume of cocaine or other substances moving through the port is, is not surprising because, of course, they are moving through many of the ports within the region to a variety of degrees. I think we can't discount the role that, that Mombasa is playing, but also I don't think we should overemphasize the importance of Mombasa in the region. But something that Jason's research has shown is that although Mombasa is an important point, it's just one of a number along the seaboard of East and Southern Africa, places like Dar es Salaam, or Zanzibar in Tanzania, or Durban in South Africa, and then Pemba and Nikala in Mozambique. You're seeing a situation where the trade is not necessarily reliant on large container ports as perhaps it had in the past. You're seeing situations now where large vessels are anchoring offshore in international waters, putting them out of the jurisdiction of national maritime forces and offloading their products to small flotillas of uh, fishing boats and other craft. These are craft, of course, that don't have to have beacons on them and craft that can then take these shipments to shore where they're disaggregated and either stored or moved along the supply chain to, to other locations. So while Mombasa is uh, one of the elements within the distribution chain of, of illicit drugs, it's in no way the most important element. And I think we need to look further afield. We need to keep examining the situation, keep trying to understand further, because 
These are networks that continue to adapt, continue to react to situations, continue to evolve and continue to get better. And so at this point, let's just take a quick detour to Mozambique. Mozambique sees multi-ton volumes of cocaine arrive on massive container ships in places like Pemba and Nakala, but other places as well. And then we have what Jason just described, a sort of mothership that anchors offshore in international waters where the cocaine is then transferred to smaller fishing vessels. Once on shore, it's transferred to private warehouses where the cocaine is cut down into smaller packages and transferred, sometimes by truck, to countries like Malawi, Zimbabwe, Eswatini and, of course, South Africa. This route along the Mozambique Channel is pretty significant. If we look at something like the Mozambique Channel, which is, of course, the, the large body of water between uh, Madagascar and, and the mainland of the continent, we're seeing an increasing amount of traffic flowing through there. And this is a body of water that has quite limited interdiction, marine force interdiction capacities related to it. Yes, South Africa has some assets that they can pass to the region, but certainly this is an area that is south of the Combined Maritime Forces jur Jurisdiction Area, the CTF-150. The CTF-150 is the Combined Task Force 150, which is a multinational task force working under UN Security Council resolutions, which means they have to follow the rules, precisely. Its mission is to prevent terrorism and the illegal trade of drugs and weapons which funds and supports international terrorist organizations. But interestingly, uh, they tend only to, to interdict DAOs, and this is because of the limitations of their operational ability. They are unable to interdict uh, large vessels, large flag vessels, and it's certainly the case that large amounts of illicit substances are moving uh, in these large vessels in international waters and moving not only from east to west, going south through the, the Mozambique Channel, but moving from south to north, bringing cocaine and, and other substances up towards Middle Eastern ports and, and further afield to Asia. Now, this is where things get complicated. The CTF-150, as Jason was saying, they target smaller vessels like DAOs, but they leave larger flagships alone. This is not because they're not allowed to target larger vessels, but when a ship is flagged, to board it or search it or whatever, it would cause a lot of potential legal, let's say, difficulties. Whereas DAOs and other smaller unflagged vessels, they're fair game. So let me just tell you a little story. In 2021, Brazilian federal police seized five tons of cocaine concealed in a cargo of powdered soap in Rio de Janeiro. This huge haul was destined for Mozambique. In November that same year, a Mozambican man was arrested attempting to board a flight to Maputo from Rio. He was traveling with five kilograms of cocaine hidden inside seven-day candles. So... You see, Mozambique has become so important on the southern route for cocaine, much of which ultimately ends up in South Africa, as the user numbers and metric tons suggest. But also, as Jason just said, it heads north. And I often get asked the question about who is involved with things like this. And I can give you one good example in relation to Mozambique to show how important the country and the region have become. You may have heard of a man called Gilberto Aparecido dos Santos, a.k.a. Fumino. Well, back in 2020, he and two Nigerians were arrested in a luxury hotel in Maputo, the capital of Mozambique. Fumino, de 49 anos, é considerado pelas autoridades brasileiras como o maior fornecedor de cocaína a uma organização criminosa designada Primeiro Comando da Capital, PCC, com milhares de membros no Brasil e países vizinhos. Police seized a fake Brazilian passport, some cannabis, more than a dozen mobile phones and a car. At the time, he was one of the most wanted fugitives in Brazil. So what was he doing there? Well, in Sao Paulo, Brazil, there is a powerful organised crime group that was born out of the Brazilian prisons called Primeiro Comando de Capital, or more commonly known as the PCC. They've become pretty dominant in the cocaine trade between Brazil and Europe, exporting from the port city of Santos. 
Firmino was closely linked to the leader of the PCC, Marcos Williams Herbas Camacho, aka Marcola, currently serving a 200-year prison sentence in a maximum security federal prison in Brazil, from where he reportedly continued to run PCC business. Firmino has been accused of allegedly financing a plot to spring Marcola from jail. Anyway, why have they chosen Mozambique as a channel for their cocaine? It's likely because these two countries share a long relationship. Both were former colonies of the Portuguese Empire, so they already share historical, linguistic and transport connections. Then the widespread and high-level corruption in Mozambique probably also helps. And if you want more on that, we did an episode on the ongoing insurgency in Cabo Delgado in the north of Mozambique back in Series 2. And there'll be a link in the podcast notes. To end the story of the cocaine, once it enters South Africa from Mozambique, aside from the sizable domestic market, the cocaine essentially ends up in Johannesburg, a huge city. It also has the City Deep Container Depot, or OR Tambo International Airport, as we heard before, where high levels of corruption allow the Mozambican cocaine to be transported to other international markets in Europe and Asia. Over the last two days, police swooped on 34 properties across Auckland to net people they say are key players in the illicit drug scene. Among the 26 people they've arrested, police say some were involved in the importation of Class A and B drugs, including methamphetamine and MDMA. And they believe they've busted up a big syndicate. It's December 2022 in New Zealand, and standing in a courtroom in Auckland is the acting national commander of the Comancheros Motorcycle Club and Drug Syndicate, Sayana Faka Osilea. Faka Osilea had pled guilty to supplying methamphetamine, but was also found guilty of conspiring to import 600 kilograms of meth from South Africa, estimated to be worth around 90 million New Zealand dollars, which is around 57 million US dollars. He was sentenced to over 13 years in prison. Just a month earlier, in November 2022, at the Port of Clark in the city of San Fernando in the Philippines, customs officers intercepted a shipment that was supposed to contain shoes. After further investigation, a number of transparent bags wrapped in duct tape were found concealed inside the lining of five handbags. Perhaps they doubled as shoes, I'm not sure. Anyway, the amount seized was thought to be worth around 200,000 US dollars. The consignment had come from Kempton Park, a city gradually being swallowed up by Johannesburg and also the location of OR Tambo International Airport. Then do you remember that seizure in India that I mentioned at the very start? 158 kilograms of meth alongside cocaine was discovered in a consignment of fresh fruit. It reportedly came from South Africa, specifically from an export company with an address in the industrial suburb of City Deep, Johannesburg. The same place with that container depot that has become so important for the Mozambican channel. What is methamphetamine, otherwise known as crystal meth? Firstly, it's synthetic, so it's man-made. The crystal part comes because it looks like little shards of glass. It can be synthesized using several different cooking methods. Most illicit forms tend to use one of two precursor chemicals, pseudoephedrine or ephedrine, otherwise known as PE, and the other is benzyl methyl ketone or BMK. Traditionally, PE has been the favored method, but the Mexican meth cartels favor the BMK method as it's cheaper and it produces more. And this is a trend now being seen in other parts of the world. But certainly, of course, the availability of precursors can determine which of these methods are chosen. Crystal meth is available across eastern southern Africa, and it's also being manufactured in the region, dramatically increasing volumes of the illicit drug for the domestic market. And of course, we heard earlier about the variety of places that South African meth has been seized. The huge volumes being produced are well and truly integrated into international supply chains. Another interesting aspect of the meth market is that the drug itself is also being used as a currency. And what I mean by that is meth is being exchanged for other illicit goods. A great example of this actually lies in the very history of meth in South Africa. 
and it involves a change in fishing licensing in 1994 and a type of sea snail. After the transition and with the new rules that were put in place, fishing licenses went to large uh, fishing operators and in many cases, operators who were not even resident in the region. And the state also enforced or created a mechanism to try and crack down on those who were fishing uh, without these uh, commercial licenses which led to a significant impact on traditional fishers. And as a result, the poaching of abalone, uh, but also other marine species, began to increase significantly. First, as a way of some of these uh, communities to to try and find a, a livelihood resource to try and pay their bills and support their families. The existence of Chinese syndicates in South Africa certainly predated the transition of 1994, and uh, some say it could, could go back as far as the 1970s. Certainly, abalone is an exotic food product at that time, and, and still to some degree today, that commanded high prices in places like Hong Kong. And so these syndicates saw an opportunity from these uh, poachers to acquire abalone at a very cheap price which they could then smuggle out of the country, smuggle into uh, Hong Kong and sell at very high prices. Again, I mean, organized criminal groups take advantage of opportunities when they see them arise. And so this occurred. And Cape gangs that are endemic in the um, Cape Town and Cape Flats region began to come into this trade, uh, began to take over this, this poaching and, and this, uh, this illicit trade to then engage in a relationship whereby they would acquire the poached abalone and they would trade it to the Chinese syndicates. Now, trading a, a large amount of cash is, is a problem. It's a problem. I mean, cash is heavy and it's uh, conspicuous. It's a flag to law enforcement. So the adaptation that was made was, in fact, not to trade abalone for cash, but to, to trade abalone for precursor chemicals, initially for those chemicals that were used to produce mandrax, methacolone, which was a common, uh, and still today, used, used in the region. These are chemicals that Chinese syndicates could get cheaply and easily in mainland China, because, of course, at the time, they, they were not controlled. So for them, they were taking something that was cheap for them to acquire and import into the country and trading it for something that was valuable the abalone that they could then return and, and make huge amounts on. And for the Cape gangs, they were taking something that was cheap to them, the poached abalone, trading it with the uh, Chinese syndicates for something that was very difficult to acquire at the time, these precursor chemicals that they could then use to produce their own methacolone and then eventually methamphetamine. So it's a relationship that is at the foundation of the growth of the meth industry within the region, all based on a marine snail. And it's interesting to note that in March 1998, a Chinese shipment containing 20 tonnes of precursor chemicals destined for South Africa was seized by law enforcement. The previous year, only 8 tonnes were seized globally. Now, 20 tonnes could produce around 13 tonnes of methamphetamine. And Jason writes in his report, A Synthetic Age, The Evolution of Methamphetamine Markets in East and Southern Africa, that, and I quote, the industrial production of South African meth had begun, end quote. Okay, so our focus for this episode is on Eastern Southern Africa, but I just wanted to add that Nigeria was the first country after South Africa to have a domestic meth lab seized, again showing the industrialization of meth in that country. But what's really interesting was that in 2012, a Latin American influenced meth lab was seized. You might ask what that means. Well, four Bolivian technical experts were teaching Nigerians how to make meth. Four years later, a Mexican super lab was seized in Nigeria, capable of producing four tons of meth a week. Now, it's alleged that the Nigerian syndicates had learned from the Mexican cartels and were now producing meth using the cheaper BMK method, meaning increased production. In addition to that, it shows that Nigeria has become an important destination and transshipment point for the precursors coming from India and China, but also that Mexican cartels are expanding their influence. It's alleged that these super labs were created to target the East Asian market. And according to some of the drug users interviewed for Jason's research, the Mexican meth made in Nigeria has made its way down into the South African markets, and this has been largely driven 
by Nigerian distributors. Nigerians had been acting in many cases as a middle broker role within South Africa between the uh, Chinese syndicate production and the Cape Gang distributors and, and other distributors. This evolution of production in Nigeria then moved them up the supply chain ladder to become uh, producers and distributors in their own right. And you saw a lot of precursor chemicals that had traditionally been going towards South Africa, move again towards Nigeria and West Africa. Now, did law enforcement have some role in this? Uh, maybe a minor, minor role, but, but what's more important, I think, was the industrialized nature of the production that was occurring in Nigeria and the lack or, or the reduction in risk of interdiction that exists there. And then, of course, there's the nature of economies of scale and the distribution of meth in that regard. So certainly Nigeria is one of the primary distribution points for meth in South Africa today, but also Afghanistan and the significant increase in meth production that's occurring there on the Pakistan border has led to a supply chain through uh, Pakistan and Iran that is also feeding South Africa. And most recently, we've uh, identified a supply chain for Mexican-produced methamphetamine that is transiting Brazil and, and coming into South Africa. And again, this, this shouldn't be a surprise either, given that there is a significant flow of cocaine that transits Brazil and, and moves directly into South Africa as well. So these are simply highways that are pre-existing, that are supplying a market, a, a large consumer market, on which a different commodity is being added to flow along these drug highways. Despite this reduction in domestic manufacturing of meth, South Africa is still a major manufacturer as well as a key destination market for the drug coming from Nigeria and a relatively new meth coming from South Asia. And it's also a transit country for the drug, with meth originating in South Africa being seized all over the world as we heard earlier. This global trade also means the market is linked to transnational organized criminal groups from Mexico, Tanzania, China, Mozambique, Pakistan, and so on. But what about the domestic market in South Africa and the users themselves? Up until this research, there's been very little data on population size estimates of people who use drugs, and that's across a range of drugs, including heroin, methamphetamine, cocaine. This is a drug researcher and user from South Africa. From this study, with, with the methods that we use, we managed to get an, a median estimate of around 290,000 people who, use, who are using methamphetamine in the last year. But that also has a probability range of around 250 to 450,000 people. So we have a range of population size estimates for that, um, but a median value of around 290,000 people using methamphetamine. That sizable number of users means one thing, money. And that is fundamentally at the root of all illicit markets. Methamphetamine pricing makes it extremely accessible. Prices range from 20 Rand for a packet to up to 300 or 250 to 300 Rand for a gram. So a 20 Rand packet might contain around 100 milligrams of methamphetamine. You can get 100 Rand packets, which could contain between 250 to 500 milligrams. And then a gram would cost, you know, between 250 to 300 rand. And the estimated market value that we got for methamphetamine from the study was around 800 million US dollars. So that's quite a substantial amount. There was a short quote in Jason's report, which was lifted from another source. It was an interview with an expert in drug markets in 1995. And he declared that, and I quote, Police and customs officials have moved beyond facilitating smuggling to becoming actively involved as couriers, end quote. That was 25 years ago. And according to those who use drugs, low-level and poorly paid police officers essentially run protection rackets. Dealers who give money to the officers are left alone. Those that don't are arrested and have their drugs confiscated. Those drugs are then sold back into the market by the corrupt officers themselves. It makes you wonder how a society can build any form of resilience to an illicit market such as this when those who are entrusted to fight it choose to facilitate it instead. And those that are impacted by this are so often those at the very bottom. In South Africa, methamphetamine is, is criminalized. People face criminal sanctions and penalties for possession, distribution um, and manufacturing. Unfortunately, because of the current criminalization of people who use methamphetamine, it's often the end users which are most 
harshly hit. So it's people maybe getting arrested for small amounts, possessing small amounts, possessing, you know, drug paraphernalia, whether that's uh, lollies, which is a glass pipe here used to smoke methamphetamine, these small items, and it's often the end users which are, are most affected. Street-based people who are using methamphetamine will often come in contact with law enforcement. If they do find drug paraphernalia on them, they'll often be arrested and taken to the police station. So yeah, it's, it's the end user which is most harshly hit in South Africa. Finally, I wanted to very briefly touch on a discovery that was a new finding from Jason's research, which he described as unique both in terms of its emergence as well as its point of origin, and that's Afghanistan. Over the past few years, there's been a significant increase in meth production in the country after producers in Afghanistan discovered that the ephedra plant, locally known as Oman, which is a kind of lovely green shrub that gets these quite striking red berry-like fruits. But it also happens that this plant naturally contains ephedrine, one of those key precursor chemicals required to produce crystal meth. And it grows all over the place in northern and central Afghanistan. The increase in methamphetamine production in Afghanistan likely far outstrips domestic consumption, and so it needs somewhere else to go. And so meth distributors who were interviewed for Jason's report have said that this new source known as Pakistani meth is now supplying the South African market. And the route it's traveling is old and familiar because it's been used to traffic a different drug into Africa for decades, heroin. The East African coast has a long history of trade. The traditional Dows with their distinctive sails have traversed this waterway for centuries. And so it's hardly surprising that heroin, originating in the vast opium poppy fields of Afghanistan and Myanmar, follows those same routes and enters East and Southern Africa. Now, as far as we know, it was West Africa and Nigeria that was recognized as one of the first African nations to import heroin in any significant volume, and that was back in the 50s. It was the West African region that became the initial transit hub for heroin due to its geographical location between production markets in the East and the US and Europe in the West. Over time, law enforcement began to monitor transportation routes from West Africa to Europe more heavily, so organized crime, always adaptable, shifted to East Africa via transcontinental routes before trafficking the heroin to the US and Europe, making it once again easier to conceal the illicit drug in ever-expanding global cargo trade. The Nigerian networks who controlled the trade in East and Southern Africa used local fixers, but eventually those local fixers replaced those Nigerian networks and took control of the heroin trade, creating their own local organized criminal networks. Now, around 40 years after heroin first hit the streets in East and Southern Africa, the heroin economies remain resilient and profitable. Jason coined a term for the growth of the heroin economy in this region, and his paper is named after it, A Shallow Flood, the Diffusion of Heroin in Eastern and Southern Africa. And it tried to look beyond the coastal communities, the places where the illicit drugs make landfall, like Mombasa or Dar es Salaam, and how the heroin market had changed over the previous decades. We were seeing a large seepage of heroin beginning in places where it was being transited in, in high volumes. So of course there was Mombasa and Zanzibar and Dar, but there were also naturally places in South Africa that opened up after 1994 when South Africa moved forward from its apartheid past and in, in places internally, places that weren't coastal in nature, whether they be Malawi or Zambia or Botswana or Zimbabwe. So major ports, whether they're seaports or airports, were the first pin in the map, as it were, in terms of heroin moving through the continent in kind of a broken telephone kind of way as it made its way either towards a final destination in the EU or perhaps further afield to, to West Africa. And elements of these shipments were, were being consumed within the, the communities around these ports. 
Because, of course, one of the ways that facilitators are paid or brokers are paid is by getting a cut uh, of the shipment, by getting some portion of, of the heroin. And if you don't use heroin, what, what do you want to do with that? You want to convert it into cash. So it's then sold off into the community and, and a small community of users develop and, and slowly this, this begins to grow. And we saw that, that over time, these communities of users were expanding away from these ports, of course, along transportation routes, but also to smaller communities further inland. And it wasn't something that was happening rapidly. It wasn't sort of today, there's no heroin, and tomorrow there, there was heroin. It was something that built up over time in the same way that a very slow moving flood of water was going from a, a high point to a low point over a number of years. So this, this is how we saw the evolution of these small domestic points on a map that turned into eventually quite large and embedded markets of consumption for heroin. As a result, this shallow flood of heroin has seen markets spring up all over East and Southern Africa, from Didza, Malawi to Bulawayo, Zimbabwe, and from Montepuez, Mozambique to Pig's Peak in the tiny kingdom of Eswatini. It seeped into all of these places. But in this episode, I did want to focus on one country in particular, Tanzania. I'm watching a video from six years ago. It's called My Husband Styling My Hair, Natural African Hair. The young woman in red is a fashion blogger and she's talking to the camera about a hair product. She's putting this stuff all over her hair and then she calls out to her husband before turning back to the screen with a playful smile. A man walks into the room, also wearing red, and proceeds to help her before leaving about a minute later and the video continues. Now this certainly isn't a video made for the likes of me, so why am I watching it? Well these two, Shamin Mwasha and Abdul Nsembo, lived in Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. And three years after they made this video, they were both arrested for heroin trafficking and in March 2021, sentenced to life by a Tanzanian court. Now, Tanzania and in particular ports like Dar es Salaam and Zanzibar are important nodes in the trafficking of heroin into the country and the wider regional market. The life sentence Nsembo and Mwasha were given was after police found 400 grams of heroin in their home, which likely means they were relatively small players. And it makes me wonder about the structures of local heroin networks and their relationship to bigger distributors. The structure is trafficker who at times use people or receives from abroad. This one doesn't go selling around. This is Happy Hassan, one of the researchers in Tanzania. Just sell to the seller. The seller, those who sells to the, who supplies using meat sellers or who meet with the pushers. So also at times this seller doesn't being seen with the normal pushers. It's the meat seller who supplies to those, the, the pushers of number four. And then the seller will supply to the meat seller who sells to the pushers, he doesn't own it, but he's being given and being paid. And then the meat seller sells to pushers and weekly or three days attendant buyers who buys bulk, such as two to five grams, whenever when they go by. And then meat seller can sell to pushers on camps and pushers on camps and streets and ghettos. This is how the structure is. Heroin is found in most places in Tanzania, including the rural areas, where the flow is less consistent and the quality is quite poor due to repeated cutting. And yet the prices remain relatively high despite the poor quality as dealers pass on transport costs and so on. So pricing is based on availability rather than anything else. Up to now, we can say we have about 16 to 17 regions, so it is a widespread and it continues to, to spread day by day. Among uh, those who use about 95% smoke cocktail every day, and among the world society, it is about 
four to six percent and to seven percent of those who smoke cocktail. Most of the heroin sold to users comes in the form of pinches, and these come in different colors, forms, and even copycat versions of a popular brand known as Burundi Pinch. Jason goes into real detail on this in his report because much of this detail came from the users themselves, a previously silenced voice in discussions on drugs in this region. Not only new information, new, new to us as researchers, but, but it's the nuance that occurs in many situations, and it's getting different perspectives on these nuances. As researchers, often when we look at a subject, uh, we're looking at it generally from the perspective of, of being an outsider looking in. And that gaze has a particular set of biases attributed to it. And when we partnered with these different user communities, uh, user organizations, uh, I mean, we're, we're talking about the voices of nearly 3,000 people who use drugs in, in this research. So those are 3,000 different perspectives within communities that are generating interesting bits of information that being sewn together are creating some additionally in interesting narratives on what are occurring in these communities. And that is a really important point. The users are often ignored, but can provide amazing detail that would otherwise be unknown. Because those living on the edge of society and doing something illegal, getting them to open up can be quite challenging. Here's Happy. Police interference, trust from some community users, trust of why am I doing this work? What will follow? Why this work? Why this research? Why do I need pictures? Why the numbers of community? Time being so less, COVID-19 being around also interfered with our work highly. Users pushing, demanding for much peer support from us more than I can help or have it. High price of different things that I had to have or use to accomplish my work. It's interesting to hear about the natural suspicion of the users, as well as the interference from the police. And you can infer from that what you will. In a way, the response of either suspicion or interference is symptomatic of a system that does not support users and a society that stigmatizes them. As a result, it's often left to civil society to step in. They're the ones working with the community and they're the first organ dealing with the people affected or themselves being affected. So it is good in one way or another to work with the one who is in one way or the other, knowing the whereabouts of the movement of the hands. And anyone who knows or has used knows better how to address what he or she has gone through. And so finally, let's go back to the heroin market in Tanzania. One of the major issues is impunity. Traffickers have enjoyed this for quite some time, which has allowed loads of entry points to become established by both land, sea and air. The heroin comes in a variety of volumes, purity and on a frequent basis. And as Jason says in the report, given that quality can vary and yet prices stay the same, it shows that there are few barriers to entry into the heroin market for dealers and traffickers alike. So this has been a long and detailed episode, but it's just a fraction of the information that Jason and his researchers have gathered over the last few years. This new information shines a light on the prevalence of illicit drugs in communities up and down the African continent, how the domestic markets are structured and the organised criminal groups that operate it, and finally the position East and Southern Africa has within this global trade. And so, what needs to be done to tackle this growing issue? Well, I guess two things, really. The first thing is that the responses that have been taken have been wholly unsuccessful. The attempt to prohibit these markets, to interdict them with law enforcement, and to disrupt this, these markets and this trade has been entirely, unequivocally a failure. 
uh, even though seizures have increased over the, the, the past 10 or 15 years, the volume of consumption has increased. The reach of these markets has increased. The price of the substances has decreased. The availability of the substances has increased. And the purity in many places has, has continued to increase. So we have been unable to arrest and seize our way out of the expansion of these drug markets. So I think that's that's the first thing that, that comes from this, this research. The second thing that comes from the research is, is that, therefore, it's important for us to begin to reconsider the way that we develop policy around these markets, but also the way in which we engage with these markets. And what I mean here is that the role of people who use drugs is one that has been largely silent in the region. They've been marginalized. Their voices are, are muted or excluded completely. These policies need to be developed with the input of those who are often the objects of, the, of this harm. And I think that's something that has to occur going forward. I would add a final point, and that's the recognition and addressal of corruption and complicity of not only state institutions and state bodies, but actors within governments, senior, senior officials within governments as well. And the recognition of their role in facilitating the illicit trade in these substances and, of course, their involvement in, in the wider illicit trades that are occurring in this region. It's impossible to try and effectively address the harms that these markets are causing without first recognizing and responding to the contribution that corrupt officials and institutions are, are providing to the sustainability and resilience uh, of these marketplaces. And that's where we leave it for this episode of Deep Dive. A massive thank you to Jason, Eli and the three researchers that took part in this podcast. I urge you to check out all the reports mentioned in this episode. They're all listed in the podcast notes. You have a synthetic age, a powder storm and a shallow flood. We only scratch the surface of those papers. And for more information on any of these topics and other research into organised crime, head over to our website globalinitiative.net. We've also got a really cool new animation going up on YouTube to accompany each Deep Dive episode, so please go and check that out. This has been Deep Dive from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organised Crime. I'm Jack Megan Vickers. Thanks for listening.